Well, hi everyone, welcome to Interchange. I'm Dan Jones, thank you so much for joining us. We're gonna have a good conversation today, I guarantee it. <laughs> we'll talk about the race for Russ Feingold's Senate seat. Now that Tommy Thompson is out of the way, does anyone else have a real chance of beating Feingold? We'll talk about the loss of the Midwest Airlines brand and if that really means anything to Milwaukee. We'll talk about the push in Madison to make it easier for people to register to vote and whether that will encourage voter fraud. And we will talk about the Journal Sentinel winning another Pulitzer Prize. Joining us now, our newspaper columnist, Joel McNally. Kevin Fisher, aide to Republican State Senator Mary Lazic, and oftentimes a host over at WISN Radio. Denise Calloway is the communications director for the Greater Milwaukee Foundation. And Gerard Randall, consultant and job creation expert. Rick Horowitz will be along with commentary at the end of the show. All right, let's get right into it. Tommy Thompson ended all the speculation Thursday when he finally announced he would not run against Democrat Russ Feingold for the U.S. Senate. Does this mean that Russ Feingold is pretty much likely to hold on to that seat? And now who becomes the leading Republican candidate to possibly take him on? Well, I don't know that the Republican field is completed yet. Um, I think that Russ Feingold's numbers are still indicating that he's got some serious campaigning to do if he's going to hold on to that seat, and I, I firmly don't believe that that's a given. Um, some of the candidates whose names have cropped up in addition to the ones that are already in the field or expected to get in, like Leinen Kugel, uh, are Ted Cannabis, and he would probably be uh, the candidate that would galvanize the most Republican support. Uh, if Wall puts in a substantial amount of his own money to make a run, uh, I would even consider him the lead candidate before I'd consider Leinen Kugel the lead candidate in the race against him. Uh, but there are all some, uh, uh, some serious drawbacks to each of those candidates in this sense. You've got to have uh, uh, some money, some substantial money to beat fine gold. You've got to have some fairly decent name recognition. You can't have a track record that uh, automatically puts you in the starting blocks as a, a candidate going down in defeat which would be the case for someone like Leinen Kugel uh, or someone that's not willing to uh, be able to raise a substantial amount of money to compete against the war chest that Feingold already has. I think on the issues, Feingold is very, very vulnerable, and that to me is the, the, the indication of why, that, that seals the indication as to why there's so many Republicans that are looking to make a run against him. Leinen Kugel doesn't seem to be driving the uh, party too crazy, though. We're not, we, by, when I say we, we Republicans are not real thrilled about a, 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 a very solid corporate citizen, a very civic-minded public servant. But on the other hand, come on, you worked for Jim Doyle for 18 months and now you're going to try to paint yourself as this uh, conservative right-winger? I don't know. That's going to be a very tough sell. Tommy Thompson was the Republicans, best I think, best and last person to give Russ Feingold a run for his money and beat him. I think he would, mm -hmm. would beat Russ Feingold. Uh, but now I don't see the Republicans with a viable candidate. My friend and colleague, State Senator Ted Cannabis, would be a very, very good candidate, uh, but he's going to get in late and there's, a, the, there's the money issue. And shame on the Republicans. Every incumbent, especially on the Democrat side, is very vulnerable given this political atmosphere in America right now. He is vulnerable on, on the issues, and yet the GOP cannot find someone, uh, a, a strong candidate. We've got decent candidates, but each one has a problem. <laughs> when you don't pay your taxes, that's a problem, right. and then you run as a fiscal conservative. That's a problem. So at this moment, I don't see anyone, unfortunately, that can beat Russ Feingold. Tommy would have beaten him, but, but now that he said, and, and, and I believe him. He wants to run, but his family says no. When I worked at WTMJ in the 90s, and they sent Charlie Sykes and I out in 96 to cover the Republican National Convention in San Diego so that it would get fair and balanced coverage. <laughs> 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 the Sunday before the convention, uh, we were all at this Sunday brunch, and I saw Sue Ann Thompson. I, I, said, I went up to her, and I said, uh, you must be disappointed because Jack Kemp had been picked as the running mate, not Tommy. She says, no, I'm not disappointed at all. I'm, I'm, I'm ecstatic. Whoa. <laughs> Why? Because Tommy Thompson isn't ready for prime time. So she obviously and her family play, it played an integral role then. They, I think, made the decision for Tommy this time, and because of that, 
I think what happened yesterday means Russ Feingold gets another six years. I, I, I'm not convinced that Russ Feingold is beatable. I, I, I actually think that he has a lot of, you know, of, of charisma and power and the, and the image that he has that actually works for both liberals and conservatives mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, the maverick image and, and even people who disagree with him say they respect him because he has integrity and he, he's not afraid to stand up against his entire party sometimes. Sometimes. Yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, so, and, and a lot of fiscal conservatives like him because he is fiscally conservative. Uh, he votes for balanced budgets. He votes against, uh, you know, uh, earmarks. He, he's the kind of fiscal guy that they like. Um, I never thought Tommy Thompson was going to run. He, he wants to run things. He doesn't want to be a junior senator, uh, one of 100 senators uh, in, the, in the party that's not even in power. Uh, that never made any sense to me. The interesting thing about what Kevin just said, the, the Republican Party's strongest candidate right now, I would say, is Lionkugel. And, but they're not smart enough to nominate him for just the reasons that Kevin articulated. The fact that he worked for Jim Doyle. He worked for Jim Doyle as a commerce secretary, building business in Wisconsin. That should be something that Republicans care about and Republicans are interested in. But no, you know, it's like this, uh, you know, if you have anything to do with, with a Democrat, you know, because they're all socialists and, and these extremists, they, they, they want... They, they are, the party has become so narrow and, and so right-wing, as, as Kevin said, uh, that they won't consider their strongest candidate, even though he is a strong leader and he has name recognition and all that. I'm glad they're not going to nominate him because I think he'd be the strongest candidate. I, I, I do believe that when people walk into the polling place, the majority of people vote on one thing, and that is name recognition. They do. One thing. They do, and, and, and Lining Kugel has positive name recognition. Yeah. Well, he has name recognition. I don't know if it's positive or not, but you know, everybody's heard of Lining Kugel. Uh, some of us around this table have, have had one <laughs> or two. Um, but I, I think the the issue is, I think that Fine Gold. I think it's, he's very difficult to beat. He has that incredible name recognition. He has four million dollars. Yeah, that's tough. Um, it, that's going to be a tough piece to to do in terms of raising enough money to compete against that. But beyond that, I think if there is not a Republican candidate that really captures people's attention, their imagination, and some interest, that people are not going to come out just to vote against Russ Feingold. So I think if there isn't a Republican candidate that somehow, and I think you're you're right, Kevin. I don't know that anybody's going to catch on fire. Um, if that Not doesn't at this happen, stage of the game. no, and and I think that is perhaps the unfortunate thing about this whole discussion about whether or not Governor Thompson was going to run. It's the time that Republicans lost, kind of waiting to see what was going to happen. That at the end of the day, I think is going to benefit Feingold. All right, next topic. So the new owner of Midwest Airlines kills that name this week and says <coughs> the new name will be Frontier. I think we're all proud of the great reputation that Midwest Airlines used to have, but it had gradually morphed into a regular airline anyway. So I don't think this is really all that much of a loss to Milwaukee, as long as they keep the jobs here. <laughs> well, and I think you're right on that. The, uh, the Midwest Airlines that I had become fond of flying, and, and I think many others, was the roomy airline that used to serve you champagne on your flights that was included in the price of the, of the ticket. You had, uh, up until 9-11, uh, you had uh, plates that uh, you with received silverware. with silverware and, yeah. and cloth napkins uh, that you uh, and, and, received and uh, with your meals. Air, airline food. <laughs> and and, it, and it, it was. It was just a first-class flight uh, for coach prices. Uh, that has long gone. That's and the only boring. thing that most folk can remember about the airline, uh, aside from the fact that it had many direct routes, which even now they don't have anymore, uh, are the cookies. Well, people are willing to sacrifice. <laughs> you, can, um, you can buy the, those the in the in here. Or <laughs> getting the someplace. And have them before you well, that's it. You want to get someplace fast, you want to get someplace at a reasonable cost, and you want to make sure that there's great customer service. I think. Uh, uh, most of the airlines that are now hubbed here in Milwaukee, like Southwest or Frontier, or <coughs> Delta for that matter, uh, will be able to be just as competitive uh, for the Milwaukee market as Midwest was when they held But sweat. branding is important. And to lose the name of Midwest that's been associated with us for such a long, long time, I, th I think is, is sad. Uh, and Frontier connotes... Uh, a bunch of sheep herders out there and, and cattle calls and guys with 10-gallon hats. It, it makes <laughs> us sound like something out of the 1800s. Uh, and and the, the, the lame argument, well, that Midwest uh, uh, kind of compart 
mentalized us. Right. That is just wrong. How, how does Southwest make it? Yeah. How does Northwest make it? How does Alaska Airlines make it with all their flights uh, to and from Cal California? And with their former governor. Right. Yeah, so, so I think it's, it's yes, you, you nailed it. We have morphed into just another airline. The old Midwest was gone. The only remnant that was left was the moniker, was the name, mm -hmm. and that too is gone with this bonanza type nickname now. I, I don't like it, and it's it's just like the final nail in the coffin. Well, but but that that Midwest name means something to us. But I got to tell you, people in other cities, it meant uh, some rinky-dink, uh, you know, regional airline. They they never associated it with a national airline. Uh, we had we went back when Midwest was a great airline to fly on. We'd have to convince people to use it who who didn't live here. When, in when they finally boarded, they when they did, wow. they were blown away. Right. right. Uh, I actually think Frontier, <laughs> despite what you just said, Kevin. <laughs> is much better at marketing right now. Uh, yeah, I got to tell you, my wife loves. Well, it's because the animals loves on the tails. to fly on Frontier because of the animals, animals on the tail, and she thinks they're so cute. And she'll tell me every flight Fine. she's been on which animal which it was. I was on the koala yeah, last yeah, week. Yeah, exactly. or, yeah. Fine, let's yeah. paint yeah. bowling balls on the side <laughs> of the planes too. But well, I, we are going to get a badger out of it. They're, so, I mean, they're, it's not they're like better at marketing. I agree that the real distinction in the Midwest we all lost when we lost the seats and we lost. Yeah, I lost the distinction. Right, I don't. I don't think there was. Unfortunately, a Midwest brand that was left to salvage. Um, it just wasn't. We had just become a regular airline. I think perhaps the, the one kind of lasting impression and the one lasting benefit that we'll see from Midwest and the time that it had here was that it did become a good regional carrier with lots of direct flights, which made it attractive in terms of the, although I hate this phrase, the third airport for Chicago. What that did was that <clears throat> brought in AirTran, and it brought in Southwest, and it did bring in Frontier. So as flying consumers, we actually probably have more choices now than we did when Midwest was at its strongest. So I think that's one good thing that comes out of this, if, if we can say that there is I a good thing. I think we're going to lose, though, the corporate citizenship that, yep. frankly, was all over the place. All I can't the charitable tell you, donations. That's right. I, the number of auctions, uh, silent auctions, at charitable mm -hmm. events. But, but that they're you bringing would in more jobs. They're bringing in more jobs in Midwest. Well, was. Midwest, they, actually, after they took all of our tax money to, to help them stay here, uh, then started laying off local people and, and, and bringing in pilots from the outside. And that, you know, so they kind of betrayed it, all it, that, it, it, well. that that I do believe is going to happen the jobs aspect as long as we continue to be a hub for like AirTran uh, Southwest certainly will bring in more jobs but again when you get back to uh, the corporate sponsorships their uh, their seemingly ubiquitous involvement in the charitable community. causes in the it's community gone. and now we don't have that we it, it, I'm hard-pressed to tell you who the contact people are uh, with these airlines so that you can get them engaged in some of the civic life here in this community. And, and once that starts to happen, I think people will have a different comfort level about the changes that have been made. Did you read any, I, I think, any marketing I think it will stuff? Happen, though. I did, do. Did I think you read any happen. marketing stuff as to why, if Republic owned Midwest and Frontier, why they just didn't call it all Republic? You know, I don't know if you remember years and years ago, there used to be a Republic airline that was here and it was not necessarily thought of as being a very good or very efficient yeah. airline. And I, I uh, think plus, Frontier plus, had better marketing well, than Republic. It, it did and they've spent a lot of money to market Frontier. Yeah. So you, you have a choice of saying we've got a good brand here with Frontier. Do we decide we're going to stick with this and, and Midwest is going to fold into this or do we start all over again with Republic? And it, it, it's a lot of money. They've had good results with the Frontier brand, and you don't know what's going to come out of, of trying to rebrand yourself as yet a, a third name. So I, I think they took a look at what the strongest brand was that they had, how they'd be able to build on it, and we're now Frontier. All right, yeah. next Horses topic. and cows. <laughs> we have to talk about the push in Madison to change the voter registration <clears throat> laws. Suggestions include automatically registering people when they get their driver's licenses and t letting others request absentee ballots online without a signature. Supporters say we should make it as easy as possible and encourage as many people as possible to take part in elections, and this is the way to do it. Others, including Wisconsin's Attorney General, say the only thing this is going to encourage is voter fraud. And, and, and we've had this argument endlessly. Uh, Republicans are the only people who claim there's voter fraud. And that's because they don't want to encourage everyone to vote. They, they would rather, you know, that poor people, that older people, that the people they think are going to vote Democratic not vote. 
Uh, and the Democrats are on the side of the angels. They can say, we just want everybody to be able to vote. Uh, and legal or not. And, uh, yeah, but there is no voter fraud. And okay. we, can, we can bring that up over and over. It, the, every time a prosecutor, the U.S. attorney, the district attorney's office here, they, they've gone over and over all of these allegations from the Republicans, and they may have found half a dozen people who have ever voted illegally. That is not changing any elections. The, the, it is absurd for someone to think that voting twice is going to affect an election and they could go to federal prison for it. So it is, it is just, you know, it is, they've never found very much voter fraud. We know that the Bush administration, they fired U.S. attorneys because they weren't prosecuting enough people for voter <coughs> fraud. Uh, the, Stephen Buscubic, the, the Republican U.S. attorney here, along with the Democratic district attorney, uh, said there is no voter That's fraud. That's not what they said. Uh, and, and, you know, it is, you know, they're, it is just so simple. Republicans would rather fewer people vote and Democrats would rather more people vote. I think, do we want to engage more people in democracy? I yeah. think that's really the issue and the, and the question. And if we take a look at the existing laws that are in place as it relates back to voter registration, um, they are a bit antiquated. There are new technologies that can be used that can engage more people in the process. I think that's, you know, what we all want. We want more people engaged in the process. This is a way to do it. And I, I also think um, it's very cynical to assume that if somehow we make it easier for people to vote, that bam, the first thing that's going to happen is that we're going to have fraud. I, I, I just think that's very cynical, and I, I agree with Joel. We just have not seen, everybody says, oh, there's going to be voter fraud. We're going to make these changes. If we take a look at what's happened either in other countries or in other states where they've made changes and made it easier to vote, there have not been massive cases of voter fraud. I just think it's a red herring. We're, we're, the real problem is not enough people vote. You know, we should be encouraging more people to vote, not try to make it more difficult. Because somehow, if we, they're allowed to vote, they're gonna they're gonna cheat and lie and steal. But, but here, here's a flippant comment: if, if people are too lazy and too stupid to figure out how to register right now to vote, should they even be voting? Period. Well, you know, I, <laughs> voter. ID, voter ID, voter ID, and I will All sing long. that mantra as long as I hear we need to expand the opportunities for people to vote. I don't. No one I, votes I, without I, identifying I'm, I'm, themselves. I'm, I'm, I'm strongly in favor. We don't favor. have people voting anonymously. I am strongly in favor of expanding opportunities for people to vote. I vote in every election uh, that I can, and 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 I rarely miss. But what I do find is that you have to be motivated to want to go out and exercise your citizenship right. And you also have to make sure that when I go or when others go, that they aren't going and having their vote diluted by those who go and have absolutely no intention of participating fairly. You do have people who vote multiple times. You do have people Give who vote in areas addresses. where they don't live. So if, if you can come up with a process to allow people to be automatically registered to vote when they go get their driver's licenses, why can't you use the driver's license or some expanded, easily accessed identification for people to take with them when they go to vote. Everyone identifies themselves when they vote. Well, they not in correctly. They, they, no, 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 no. They go in and they say, I'm so-and-so. I'm so Gerard and so and so. Randall. And if you don't have anything that is government issued that indicates mm. you are who you say you are, yeah. it's taken at face value. Let me why, why, not just have, why not just have a separate desk at the DOT for the people who no. aren't drivers to go get their voter ID well, card? That, yeah, well, okay. You can do that. Okay, but let's take the partisanship out of this. We have not talked at all about what this bill would do. You would. There are several components that are scary. That the the minute you register your vehicle, you are already registered to vote. That just invites fraud. <laughs> you're gonna make it. You're gonna make, you make it so that you don't have to sign a signature a or have a witness or have a witness when you go in and get an absentee ballot. Now, we had in Madison this week, nonpartisan people, the real experts on this issue, municipal clerks from around the state, who said. That, okay, yeah, you want to make it easy for people to vote, that's fine, but you also have to pair that with a reduction in the possibility of fraud. And this bill doesn't do that. It just does the opposite. You're going to have a flood of more absentee ballots, and these, these clerks are not going to be able to handle it. 
It's an unfunded state mandate that's going to cost the clerks all around the state $3.2 million. It doesn't add staff. What if you uh, eliminate Saturday uh, mail delivery? That will impair the absentee ballot process. They won't have the people to handle this. And if someone t uh, uh, takes an absentee ballot, it's put in the system and it, it, it is marked incorrectly. It, got, it gets spit out. That person is disenfranchised because he or she doesn't know that his or her vote didn't count. This is really a problem. And if any fair-minded individual is, would say that if you are going to overhaul the state's election system with these dramatic changes, that you should have at least both political parties at the table and not one party ramming this down the <laughs> voters' throats in the final days of the legislative session. All right. Well, we have to talk for just a few minutes about another Pulitzer Prize for the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. This one for Raquel Rutledge's great work exposing all the fraud in the state-funded child care programs. This is a second Pulitzer for the paper in the last three years. Does this make it a great newspaper again? We, <laughs> we beat them up all the time. Is it a great newspaper? I, I think Raquel uh, is a great reporter. I think Dave Umhafer, who won the last one, is a great reporter. I don't think it has anything to do with the fact that Sig Gisler, the former editor of the journal, <laughs> is now the executive director of the Pulitzer Board. I don't think that's got anything to do with it. I'm glad you said that. <laughs> I was going to a few I, I, you know, I, 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 you know, Raquel's uh, series uh, all won kids. all kinds of national mm -hmm. awards, and and it was very well deserved. And, and, and let's not forget Dan Egan, who was a finalist yeah. uh, for the award as well. You know, in some ways, this is, I think, what we're seeing is some really good, sharp, focused, investigating reporting um, on the part of the Journal Sentinel. That that's that's it. I agree, um, and but I there's think not they, enough of it. Well, I, and I think, but you and know, the question I, was, does this make them a great newspaper? No, it makes no, this but, series but, but, of articles great. No, but let me great. finish. I, I don't, I don't know that we know at this point in time what makes a great newspaper in 2010 because the whole business is so different. Maybe the last one to survive. What makes a great, great, great newspaper? Great newspaper is one that people year. will buy and read. Is this, and that's is not this the new journalism? Uh, fewer people, but. People doing really constant. Well, yeah, fewer work. people. Yeah, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the industry is getting downsized like crazy, and and that hurts the product because but nobody at the you local don't city see hall. enough no, of the Raquel no. Rutledge's you, 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 and these investigative series. You, you won't have the broad-based coverage that you used to have. In fact, you're going to get snippets, uh, newspaper sound bites, as it were, uh, because they are stretched so thin, or they will be trying to take uh, AP sources and tailoring them to fit the local market. I, I, I'm very, very congratulatory of, of, uh, uh, of the, 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 the Pulitzer that they won. However, I think you also have to look deeper and note that with all of the cuts, with the drop in readership, with the number of people who uh, have expressed very little interest in reading the newspaper in paper form, uh, most are getting their news from other the, sources. Uh, the industry is in denial. It has not figured but, out but how I, to I think, what, I think yes. what we need to kind of focus on, though, is that even with all this upheaval, the Journal Sentinel has been committed to these kinds of series and giving reporters time to investigate critical not issues enough. in the community. Not uh, well, but, you know, it's doing a lot better than some other papers that have gone to now publishing only a handful of days a week. Okay, we continue. You know, sometimes politicians get into trouble for something that they said. And sometimes they get into trouble for something they neglected to say. And if you're the governor of Virginia, well, you can find yourself in big trouble for both. Here's Rick Horowitz. A proclamation. Whereas April is the month in which the people of Virginia joined the Confederate States of America in a four-year war between the states for independence. And whereas Virginia has long recognized her Confederate history, her numerous Civil War battlefields, and all those who fought for their homes and communities in a time very different from ours today, if you know what I mean. And whereas there was no way I was going to let my attorney general get all the props for sucking up to the state's rights and Tea Party folks without trying to grab some of that right-thinking love for myself, and whereas I thought it would be a good idea to demonstrate to certain especially ticked-off Virginians that I feel their pain, especially with what's-his-name in the White House, and whereas I didn't think anybody else would notice and whereas I issued an official proclamation declaring April to be Confederate History Month in Virginia, urging people to remember the Confederacy's great sacrifices and come spend their money, but making no mention whatsoever of the institution of slavery, and whereas when asked to justify this omission, I explained that I had focused on the most historically significant matters and that slavery didn't make the cut, 
and whereas I immediately became a national laughingstock, and whereas I don't like being a national laughingstock, and whereas I quickly issued an apology for this omission and even amended the original proclamation to say all the correct things about slavery being a central cause of the war between the states, as well as an evil and inhumane practice and a lasting stain on the soul of Virginia and blah, blah, blah. And whereas the apology said so many correct things about slavery in such a contrite tone that many people wondered how I ever could have failed to mention them to begin with, and whereas many of these same people therefore questioned the sincerity of my apology, and whereas many of these people concluded that I was simply trying to save my butt, and whereas I admit that the thought did cross my mind more than once, and whereas sometimes you just do what you have to do, now, therefore, I, Robert McDonald, Governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia, do hereby want the whole darn thing to go away. Well, thank you, Rick, and thank you so much for watching. We'll be off the next two weeks because of oh. the upcoming Channel 10 auction. Yay. So we'll see you after that. <laughs> the cue board closes in three. <laughs>